Hi, I'm Christoph Stork. I'm with Land Seismic Noise Specialists. My talk is Optimizing Seismic Land Acquisition and Processing for Surface Scattering Noise. Now, surface scattering noise is often a big problem noise with land seismic data. It can be very strong, it affects the whole record, and it is tough to remove. One approach for dealing with this noise is acquiring denser data, but this can be expensive and it doesn't always work. So what else can be done? A recent change is recognizing that much of scattering noise is actually complex signal distortion. And this is because scattering distortion is a physical phenomenon that is repeatable and measurable. Since you can measure the distortion, you can correct for it, which means you can recover more signal from noisy data. And this is a significant development. It provides some significant opportunity to optimize acquisition and processing for the scattering distortion. Certainly develop new methods to measure and undo the scattering distortion, but also you have to take care to resolve regional components of wavelet distortion, which are important for quantitative interpretation. In acquisition, there may be more signal in your data than you think. You may need, or you definitely need modern dense land data to apply the scattering correction. Scattering noise often has wavelengths of two to four meters in X and Y, in inline and cross line. And this has some interesting implications. Number four, dense acquisition won't entirely solve the distortion problem because you end up just recording more distorted signal. And finally, number five, surface noise characteristics can change significantly over a scale of 100 meters or so, which provides some significant opportunities. This diagram shows how scattering can create so much noise. Now the scale here is very small. This is only three to 30 meters deep and 30 to 100 meters across. So this is very much just the thin near surface. Now the near, surface velocities here are usually very slow, just 100 to 200 meters per second. And this slow velocity does two things. It creates a surface waveguide that traps 95 to 99% of the energy. And then it creates very short wavelengths so that small scale heterogeneities are important, heterogeneities of one meter or so. So energy is trapped in the near surface and then hits these scatterers and they radiate as a secondary source. I call this micro scattering because of the small size of the heterogeneity and the limited distance that it travels through the near surface. Now there's been much work done on larger scale scattering, but I argue that this micro scattering is a stronger phenomenon and must be treated differently because of the scale. At the receiver, the reverse happens. An upcoming wave field hits the scatterers near the receiver and then transmits slowly to the receiver. So these scatterers act like a complex antenna and this wave equation effect distorts the source and receiver wave field. So a nearby receiver can have a very different response function caused by these near surface scatterers. We can demonstrate the source wavelet corruption with the seam model. Here we have a series of sources that are purple dots at the surface of the model. And then for each source, we have one receiver directly below it at the bottom of the model. Now, there may be some inner bed multiples here for propagating through here, but they are weak compared to the effect of the uh, surface variations up here. Here you see the effective source wavelet variations across the seam model. Now the actual physical source function at the surface is just a very narrow impulse, but the near surface 
causes a lot of ringing that lasts for quite a long time, up to 500 milliseconds after the initial source. And there are significant variations across the model. You also, if you look at this precursor event here, you can see some significant amplitude variations. You see the surface geology of the near surface down here at the bottom. Now this distortion is just distortion of the source. The reflection data also has the distortion of the receiver. So imagine if you double the distortion and then add in some additional reflectors down here that are all overlapping. You won't really be able to identify them. What you get is something like in the following slide. On the right side is the result of bad surface scattering distortion. This is a real shot gather and it has NMO applied. Compare this with the shot gather on the left side. And here we've moved the sources and receivers only a few thousand meters. And you can see the difference of signal quality is quite significant. And the only difference is the surface geology, the surface characteristics. Now note that the noise on the right appears random, and it's certainly complex, but it is repeatable and measurable if you know how to look. It's scattering distortion, not unwanted energy. And you can partially undo the distortion to recover the clean reflections, effectively converting the right side to somewhat like on the left side. So you can bring order to this complex data and you do it by performing cross correlations between neighboring traces and doing it with many shots. And here's the result of cross correlating the traces for two receivers for many shots. Each of these traces is effectively a one fold image or so I don't have time to describe this in detail, but the bottom line is that the complex data of the previous slide actually has a clear repeatable pattern, and this pattern is the surface scattering distortion. Here's an example of surface scattering distortion correction on a shot gather. So here's the data, and this is dense data without scattering correction and you can actually see some of the scattering occurring here and here and on the right side is a partial correction of the scattering it's not perfect and you can see now the energy here is a lot more continuous and then down here you can now see more coherent energy in the ellipses that didn't have coherency before Here's the result of the stack before and after the scattering distortion correction. On the left is without, and on the right is with the scattering correction. And if you especially look in the deeper part of the section where you have very poor signal to noise quality, you can see actually the most improvement. A lot of subtle features that exist here, you can see are better resolved after the scattering distortion. Here's another stack example before and after scattering distortion. Um, you can see here the signal is actually very poor quality. This is the desert of North Africa. You can see after distortion the signal quality is significantly improved, including in these actually nearly no data zones through here. You can start to see some subtle signal coming through. To optimize processing for the surface scattering noise, I've shown you how new methods can measure and undo the scattering distortion to recover more signal. Now this is significant, but also it is important to resolve the regional components of the wavelet distortion. This is for quantitative interpretations such as attribute analysis and impedance inversion. And I'll show some examples of this later. 
There are several things you can do to optimize acquisition for the surface scattering noise. Um, first, you need modern dense land data to resolve and apply the scattering correction. But you may want to recognize that there may be more signal in your data than you think, and this can be significant. Um, scattering noise often has wavelengths of two to four meters in X and Y, and this has several significant implications. Um, dense acquisition won't, in itself won't solve the regional distortion problem because you just end up recording more distorted signal. And lastly, surface noise characteristics can change significantly over a small scale such as 100 meters. And this provides some significant opportunities. So this is a conceptual display of image quality versus fold. So if you perform basic processing, that's the blue line, you can see a gradual increase in image quality as a function of fold. And the problem here is that you reach diminishing returns as you get to very high fold. But with the higher order scattering corrections, once you have enough folds to resolve the scattering and correct for it, you can significantly improve your image quality. So you need some minimal fold for the scattering correction, but massive fold may not be necessary. And this inflection point here is the sweet spot of acquisition. And it will vary, of course, based on the type of scattering that you have. Now let's discuss the implications of scattering noise often having wavelengths of only two to four meters in X and Y. Um, first, dense acquisition along a line can only reduce noise by 2x because you're missing the noise in the other y dimension. Now 2x is okay, but if you noise is 10x or 20x stronger, you're really looking for much better noise reduction than that. And it is hard to sample the noise unaliased in X and Y because it requires such small spacing. You may be able to do something like a wide line. However, you don't need to sample the noise unaliased if you can measure the scattering distortion. That handles these small scale wavelengths. So more independent source and receiver locations are actually better. If you place your receivers, say, within two meters of each other, they, they may not be collecting very independent data. Finally, in extremely noisy areas, you may want to use digital, 2D digital receiver arrays or swaths, such as a wide line or what I've described here. Now you may say this goes against having more independent receiver locations, but actually what you really want is receiver locations that are mostly independent, but they still have some amount of correlation with their neighbors. You don't want to have totally random data because then you can't find any of the correlations. The regional distortion of the wavelet is important. And by regional, I mean distortion that is consistent over a thousand meters or larger. And the problem with this large consistency is that it does not stack out. So these regional components are for quantitative interpretation and Dense acquisition won't solve this regional distortion problem because you just record more distorted signal. To demonstrate the effects of this regional distortion, I'm going to use the SEAM model. And the nice thing about the SEAM model, of course, is that we know the correct answer. So we have some geobodies here at depth, which are the objective. And you see the velocity model here, and you'll notice there's some complications in the near surface. This is buried topography, and that's going to create regional effects on the source and the receiver. 
So here's the slide I showed you earlier that shows you the wavelet distortion along the, the source wavelet distortion along the seam model. And you see over here on the right side where I've put these circles is you notice some very consistent distortion of the source wavelet. These are over a size of about a thousand meters. And you can see that these effects are going to stack in just like the original arrival will be stacking in. Here's a demonstration of how the surface wavelet distortion harms the imaging. So these are horizon slices from 3D PSTM for the SEAM2 Barrett data. So the correct answer is over here on the right. This is the model. And on the left is the horizon slice image with no surface distortion correction. Now the result looks plausible, but you can see it's wrong. If we correct for surface distortion, we can see we get a much better image and it's much more accurate than without. So this is an example of the importance of resolving the regional surface distortion. This last item is interesting. Um, surface noise characteristics can change significantly over the scale of 100 meters or so. And what I mean by significantly is the noise can vary by a factor of three or more. And here we have a map of receiver noise that we've measured at about 40 hertz. Now black is noisy over here on the scale, while white and red is good quality data. And you can see the surface geology comes out very nicely. And it so happens that the black and blue are canyons here, which have a lot of fill, and the white and red are near the tops of mesas that are harder rock and have much better data quality. So these are dramatic variations in noise. And here's an example of just what I mean by different quality of signal. So you can see a good quality signal over here on the left, mediocre quality and poor quality. And these are the differences that we're seeing. And we see this on almost all data sets that we look at. Here's another map of noisy sources. Um, again, it correlates with surface geology. And here I've flipped the color scale where red is noisy. And, the, and we're looking at a very smaller scale. And you can see sometimes noisy sources only occur for like four shot point locations. Some of the noisy locations are fairly narrow. Well, that suggests perhaps we can avoid those noisy locations. You can predict noisy locations by several methods. You can use just rules of thumb, like canyon bottoms, dry stream beds, and swampy areas are noisy. You can also use noise analysis of a nearby legacy survey. You can use LIDAR and satellite data. And this is interesting. Here are some examples. Low frequency LIDAR actually transmits a few meters into the ground. So the different bands will tell you different things about the surface and the subsurface. So often a combination of these LIDAR bands will correlate with seismic noise of a nearby legacy data set. And finally, you can also do some small field tests. So the noise is often very irregular in a seismic survey, and, and I claim it is predictable. Also, in a seismic survey, access and costs are irregular. So I propose using irregular acquisition to compensate for the irregular access, costs, and noise. And we already do this to a some degree, but what one way is to certainly avoid noisy areas if possible. And if it's not possible to avoid noisy areas, increase the sources or receivers in those noisy areas. And that might look like something here. These are source lines, and you can see the source lines are changing in density. And in the very dense areas, we even add some zigzag source lines to increase the density without making the source spacing too tight. 
Now, if anyone's uncomfortable with this, I would argue that it's actually less risky to use irregular acquisition because so much can be already be predicted. In conclusion, much scattering noise is complex distortion of signal, which provides opportunity to optimize both processing and acquisition. In processing, new methods can measure and undo the scattering distortion and don't forget to handle the larger regional components of wavelet distortion, and that's important for quantitative interpretation. In acquisition, you may have more signal in your data than you think. You need modern dense land data to resolve and apply the scattering correction. Remember that the scattering noise often has wavelengths of two to four meters in X and Y, Dense acquisition won't necessarily solve your distortion problem because you just record, record more distorted data. And finally, surface noise characteristics can change significantly over 100 meters. And this is actually somewhat predictable if you try. Thank you very much.